My name is Angela Cox and I am the Mindset Mentor and this is the Mindset Mentor Meets Podcast. Now my aim is to discover and share the secrets of success. You'll hear engaging and uplifting interviews with business leaders at the top of their game, all primed to deliver bucketfuls of value and inspiration. We'll bring practical tips, success strategies and golden nuggets of motivation to help you unleash your absolute potential. Now, please do like, share and leave a review if you love this podcast. It really does help others to find us. Thanks for listening and let's jump in now and meet this week's fabulous guest. My guest today is Justine Lee Bell. She is the Deputy CEO at Climate Bonds Initiative. Now, Justine has spent much of her career helping business leaders and governments find solutions to the global challenges of climate change. So I'm really interested to hear more about that and to hear more about Justine, who one of my good friends tells me is absolutely awesome. So we haven't met before. Justine, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much for coming on today. Tell me, how is your day going? Oh, busy as usual. (laughs) Back to back, but all very, very good. You know, it's just Tuesday, isn't it? (laughs) Busy from the living room. That's most of our worlds right now, isn't it? That's exactly right. Trying to run a business from a flat in London is is quite a challenge, but I'm sure many are experiencing the same thing. So yeah, it is. Absolutely. We're all in it together, which kind of gives it a sense of it being not so bad when everyone's in the same boat. Exactly. Now, I can't wait to hear more about you and the brilliant career that you've had, and we'll touch on that in the moment. But to start with on the podcast, and I know you've been listening, we do what's called the shake your pom-poms moment, because this is about you being able to celebrate your success, your personal success, which we don't often get a chance to do. So if you would, I'd love it if you could share your three proudest moments with us. Thanks, Angela. It's, yeah, it's hard to sort of grapple through the mind what all of those may be or any of them, to be honest. I think this is where people become quite modest about what their successes are. But yeah, yeah I think giving to some thought would I probably start from childhood and then, you know, through the years, there's been a couple that have stood out. And I think as a child, this success around trying to get on the team of basketball specifically, right, is a child, I, I loved sports, but it didn't necessarily mean I was very good at them when I started. So in my mind, I was excellent. But when you're going through the trials and don't get the cut, then you find oh. out quickly that you're not as great as you thought you were. <laughs> but I think that that was a chance to really discover the sort of inner self of being challenged and rising to challenge. And in the experience that I had as a child training for the girls basketball team and not making the first cut and feeling devastated at the fact that I did not make the team, but then went and used that summer to get in better or improve and so that the next year I could try out and actually make it. And so one of the successes around that was that I did manage to make it the next year and made it through the cut, which was in itself excitement enough and not really needing more beyond that. But in that same year, being awarded the most valuable player, it was quite a feat, I have to say, that was not expected. So I think that that was early signs of fall and rise back up again, even if you don't make it the first round. So that definitely mark in my mind is one. I think if I looked at the second, thinking about developing years of education and so on, that was always education was a slight challenge. I think that, you know, I was never considered the A student in my class and a tendency to always find some of the difficult subjects quite, quite challenging. Things like the sciences and the maths Mm -hmm. and those. And yeah, I, you know, as university, I went to an educational psychologist. My parents had 
thought that that would be the option to sort of determine what my, you know, path of career development would be and that this educational psychologist could set some direction. Uh, the irony was is that his assessment of me and report back to my parents was, uh, yeah, I think this one needs to stay away from any of the sciences or maths and probably keep her to secretarial work. Which, exactly. So getting that kind of feedback immediately makes me go, hold on a second, something is, is not right about this. And so interestingly, I went a few days later to pick my courses and major in, in, in my university at the time, the local University of Tennessee, where I grew up and ended up taking natural sciences and majored in natural sciences. <laughs> A biology degree in the end. So there you go. <laughs> Stay away from the maths and sciences is like the worst thing that the educational psychologist could tell me or the best thing he could tell me. It's like a parent, isn't it? Saying, stay away from that boy. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And completely ignored that advice and went the complete opposite direction. But it was really through that experience and then moving through with the first degree in the sciences that then led me to the opportunity of going to Yale University. So I'd say as far as an achievement goes on that end, it was a moment in my life of thinking that I would not be able to achieve the educational side to such a degree to when going to Yale sort of solidified that. And again, reinforced that need to never give up and keep going. If there's a vision. So, yeah, so I'd say that would be the second one. And then the final one is present day, or at least more current, which is in my current role with Climate Bonds Initiative. And when we, you know, we're growing the business and beginning to move outside of the European market and looking at other markets around the world, developing teams in China, Southeast Asia, and across Africa and Latin America. It was really the work that I led on in Brazil, which was around engaging the government, particularly on the need to scale up sustainable agriculture development and the opportunity that Brazil has in that space. And finding yourself sitting in front of the Minister of Agriculture, one of the most powerful ministries in Brazil, along with the Minister of Economy and Minister of Infrastructure, and a number of different ministers sitting at table. And you tend to be not only the only woman in the room, but also the only one that is not Brazilian, that has the opportunity to set guidance on that agenda. And you have, you know, these ministers sitting around the table listening to what you have to say. Half the time, I wonder if uh, <laughs> if I'm telling them the right thing, but, <laughs> you know, direction of travel on your ideas and vision and capturing that in such a setting was really a big success, not just for myself, but for my team on being able to form those relationships. And now we have one of the most successful programs in Brazil from that moment. So yeah, I think those are probably the ones, Angela, that stand out the most. I love it. I love the fact that they span, you know, from childhood all the way up to present day. And there's this kind of theme that I'm picking up of almost like, I'll show you you know, you, I get this feedback or, you know, I get the rejection or I get the pushback and I'm going to show you that I am better and I can do it. And I, I love that kind of resilience and that tenacity about you in terms of I'm not going to give up and I'm going to keep going. And there's a real lesson in there for kids today because I think, you know, what you were saying about I'm not as good as I thought I was. I've just written a book actually that's called You're Better Than You Think You Are. And children don't have that sense of that lack of confidence like we do as adults. And you were obviously, you know, showing that in those early days when you were first trying out and then you get the knock and then another knock and the knocks are the things that hammer us down, aren't they? And what you've done is, is actually risen above that and come through anyway. It's brilliant. It's really inspiring. Thanks, Angela. I mean, I think... Yeah, growing up in a household where there was a lot of encouragement to, you know, make something of self, whatever it may be, but do something. But I think also there's a character side to it as well, because as much as the parents were encouraging and, of course, supportive, 
it really is down to self, isn't it? To, to mm. have the opportunities. And I think one of the areas that hold many people back is fear. And I just feel very blessed that fear is one of the things that I actually thrive on. If it is something that is scary, you have that moment of contemplating with that fear on what you're going to do with it. And then the joy is being able to get over it and Mm -hmm. get to the other side. And I think that would really sum up my journey really on where I've been able to get to because I haven't let that stop me from doing what I want to do. The feeling, the fear, but doing it anyway. And it would be good to understand from you, how do you do that? What's the process that you go through to step over the line of fear? Face it head on. And that's not easy for everyone to do. So I I don't know to what extent my advice would apply to all, but I hope that to anyone listening who does actually struggle with that, that there is a lot of questions around whether one should do something or not based simply on the fact of fear of failure is to fail and fail several times and keep failing until you get it right. Because it's too great to miss if you don't get on the other side. I I wish I could remember the name of it, but there's actually a Pixar. And for anybody that follows sort of the Pixar animations that come out, I think, God knows, probably Disney's bought it now, but there's a really great Finding Nemo group. And so they did a short clip, which is about this little bird that has a little chickling that's trying to get flying across the seas, but the wind is too great and it keeps sending the little bird back while all of its little friends and parents and so on are flying and soaring across the waves. And this little bird just keeps getting kicked back and kicked back until eventually it ends up succeeding and joining the flock. And, you know, those are sort of what has to happen, really. You know, you have to be determined to get through. Yeah, just keep going, just keep going, because otherwise you're going to miss out on the joy, the outcome, whatever it is that you could achieve. Yeah, exactly. And I think every fail comes with amazing lessons to reflect on. And that may not seem like a gift at the time. It's hard to see through it when the failure is all-encompassing, but it really does actually make you stronger. And Mm. so anyways my mantra to moving forward, right? Yeah, feel that fear and step over it. We like that a lot. And tell me more about your company. So the work that you do and how you're helping organizations. So yeah, I mean, we are very much at the epicenter of driving major capital towards climate change solutions. In a nutshell, that's our core focus. We know that climate change is one of the biggest complexities that is facing our human civilization this century and beyond. And of course, this is the century that is being coined, the century of volatility. So what comes with that is a need to urgently work out how we as a human civilization are going to survive this. And it sounds extremely dramatic. And for some of our listeners that may not necessarily be following what is happening on the climate change agenda globally, but it is one that has really come front and center in the last decade. And I would say even more so this year in light of the pandemic on how climate change and environmental degradation and all of the impact that we as a society are having is affecting us and affecting the overall climate. And There is a lot happening behind the scenes that many may not be aware of, which is, you know, big investors coming into this space, understanding the risk that is happening and driving their investments towards a cleaner world going forward. And so our organization is very focused on that. The business is about providing support to all different players of the market, investors, banks, governments, companies, on how they can access what is now being really seen as green investors who are sitting on trillions and are working out where to put those trillions that will end up developing a more climate-friendly world. So 
you know, we are, are really the driving force and advocacy group, but also very much on technical content and what needs to be done, what kind of investments need to be made and helping guide the market in that way. So, you know, it, it, since the, the last 10 years have become so, you know, centered around this whole discussion of climate change, you know, this has really put our business in fast track and, and a lot of demand on, on us to, to sort of meet that. So it's, yeah, exciting and also mm-hmm. keeps me very busy. <laughs> I can imagine it does. And you've got teams of people all around the world. Yes. Right? yes. We're an organization of about 70 people now. And as little as five years ago, there was three of us. So that's the kind of growth that we're talking about and the demand and growth of the market on us as a business. So we're very fortunate, especially in a time right now where businesses are really struggling. I guess for the crisis, it's put us very much in the center of it all. And teams that are across China, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So this is a lot of where the focus, including in the Europe setting and and the US market. So it's about how to connect the developed economies to the emerging economies in the form of flows of capital. And how would you describe yourself as a leader of people? What are your traits, would you say? Well, I'd say that I have a high threshold for for performance. I think that passion and commitment and loyalty are critical characteristics that I would expect to see and do see in my teams. And I think that we're very fortunate to have such excellent people in our teams with those types of characteristics. And I thrive in that environment as a leader. You know, a former boss of mine back in the day when I was living in India and working for a media Mongol who she just really was a leader in herself and led many businesses. And I remember her clearly saying to me that, look, you know, I have the ideas, but it's the people I surround myself that execute those ideas. And when I know I've got a good team, it's the ones that can take my ideas and execute them better than I could ever originally have imagined. So, and, and I really, that really stuck with me. And I think that's something that I've taken into my own skill set and leadership is to surround myself with uh, teams that, and, and members that are driven, that have the passion and ambition to see change. We're an organization that is about change and it's a big commitment to take on. But it's also really exciting and has been a blessing to see the different people coming in and out of the organization, helping us to build this and take it forward. So in a way, I rely on them in a sense to be my advisors. You know, this is the direction of travel and how we get there is the support of them as well. So I think that's probably the best way I can phrase that. Yeah, it's interesting to listen to. And you mentioned the word passion and you mentioned the word purpose. And how do you keep those things alive when you're leading remotely as opposed to being present with your people? Yeah, it's true. This has been probably our biggest challenge for many businesses this year. You know, none of us could have imagined where we would be this time last year, right? And when March hit here in London, when it was everything went into sort of a state of lockdown and, you know, one minute everything's operating as normal. And literally within days, you're realizing the seriousness of this and the fact that actually we need to close up office and everything goes online. And the business is now fully operating remotely. And this is for the safety of our staff, of course. But also what we have found is that this has actually brought us closer together in some really bizarre way and could not have expected this to be the result. But actually, we are a stronger and more closer unit than we were prior to COVID. You know, long term, it makes it challenging because a lot of the business is people facing and building new relationships and adding that to the network and the reach of what we're trying to achieve. And sometimes that is very difficult to do on a Zoom setting. 
but regular, I mean, weekly team meetings, both at the senior management level and at the general team level, we have found to be really, really important, making sure that we're setting up an environment where everybody is connected. At the same time, having that balance that you're not, you know, creating too many meetings that ends up having an exhaustion to, and I know that everybody has experienced that where I've kind of lost sight of boundaries and find myself starting at seven in the morning and not finishing until eight, nine o'clock at night. So it is a bit of, of management on that side that one has to be carefully monitoring. But, you know, all in all, I think we have managed to come out of this in, 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 a, in an okay way. And long term, we'll just have to see. But I think, you know, keeping the meetings regular, keeping a positive sort of presence in, in each of the meetings as much as you can, even when the days are difficult, is really the best way, best way forward and keeping those one-on-ones when you see some of your staff in need of that support and just being able to pick up those clues sometimes can be difficult in a webinar setting, but something that we try to, to monitor closely during this time. Yeah, that looking out for the ones that are quiet is often telling in terms of the people that are really struggling. And as you say, being able to spot that over Zoom is quite difficult. You need to almost look for the nonverbal cues and then pick up and, and go and help as much as you can. And what about you? What keeps you positive and motivated, particularly at the moment, you know, while we're all living this weird existence that we're in? Yeah, it's a timely question, Angela, because I think now reaching the end of the year, exhaustion is definitely setting in. We can't get to the holiday period fast enough yet. You know, overwhelmed thinking about that, given all that needs to get done before that holiday period actually sets in and trying to keep that positivity. You know, it's definitely switching off. I'm quite strict about not working on the weekends, which can be very, very difficult because I know that if I don't, then Mondays just end up being so, so much worse than they need to be. But that is the trade off. The trade off. <laughs> It has to be done. You know, you need to have those two days. Of course, you know, the meditation and the yoga, these are all things that before COVID, there was quite a routine in place. And one that I tried to maintain even in the COVID months of lockdown, a little bit more difficult now getting towards the end of the year because there's so much on. And I do struggle with that. I struggle to maintain that routine. For months on end, it can be in place, but one thing can shift it and then it all falls apart. And I do notice a huge difference when that happens. So meditation, I think, is underestimated in its value and is something that, you know, I continue to learn to practice and, you know, try to get good at if there's such a thing with meditation, but at least really tapping into that inner voice and peace of mind is really, really critical. And I definitely am one to easily preach it. Actually putting it into practice (laughs) is not always my strong suit, but I do try to find time for it. It's interesting what you're saying about, you know, being able to have a routine in place, a habit in place for a number of months, and then it can just undo. And, And I hear this so often, and it seems to go hand in hand with the change in the seasons as well, where the weather switches, And it seems to almost be like a switch in our minds goes off and we never do the things that make us feel good. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, my whole lifestyle and routine is flipped 180. I mean, it's just a completely different life experience than I'm having now. A lot of that is good. Some of it, of course, is challenging, but that I guess would be for anyone that is going through this. I'm sure it's a similar feeling for many. And trying to get back on that. And I think in this time of uncertainty and, you know, it's just tough to do. You know, it really is tough to do. It comes back to the purpose bit, doesn't it? You know, what's the point? And being able to really value ourselves so highly that that's the point. That's the reason why. But when you've got nothing to look forward to, that can be tough. So we've got to be kind to ourselves as well, haven't we? That's the other word that always comes through. That's true. What's your take on vulnerability? I'm always keen to hear how people view that, particularly in the workplace. Yeah, I mean, 
Vulnerability for me, I guess, is really that moment. You know, we never always have the right answers. We may not always know the right direction of travel, especially when you are managing an organization that is growing really, really fast and, you know, requires a lot of attention on internal infrastructure development, human resourcing, all the stuff that, you know, is not the exciting part of the business, but is so fundamental. And I think that in this last year and even into the last parts of 2019, it was really embarking on an area that is, you know, not my strong suit and one that I'm continuing to learn in building this business. And I think that that is created a place of vulnerability, right? Is exposure of, and this is throughout life, is just those moments of what's the right answer? What's the right way? What if I get this wrong, you know, kind of feeling. And yeah, I think I definitely grapple with that quite a bit, especially during these times, because the extradition challenge to this is the pandemic on top of of everything else. And so actually what you were saying earlier, that ability you have to step over the line of fear will serve you really well in this capacity of, you know, not knowing everything, not knowing how different elements of the business work. Your ability to be able to grapple with that and get through it will serve you. But also, I guess, being honest with people about the fact that you don't know. Mm. Are you comfortable to do that? Yeah, I think that definitely touches on the vulnerability part is accepting what you don't know and trying to do the best in figuring it out. And, you know, that exposure to the lack of experience, if it may be, it's a moment in time and it can definitely change. It's up to you how you want to change it. But there is that moment of feeling exposed, right? And especially when you're a leader, you know, you tend to not want to show that often. And so you hope that you have people around you that you can depend on as, you know, the people that can help you get through those periods and teach you. And it's very timely that we have this conversation because it's a live point that I'm I'm going through now. And just within this, you know, the days of this week, it's been sort of turning around in in a really positive way of, we're not really knowing how to handle a situation last week and then having a grand plan on how we're going to approach it and how I can take it forward. And, and having that in place has been, you know, it's those little wins that make you know that you are, or at least encouraging and keeping you on the right path that you can do this. That is really important. And I guess from that then, having the checkpoints to see how far you've come. So, you know, even last week, not knowing something this week, having a plan and being able to actually celebrate that Mm. as a bit of success. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You just want to make sure you get it right. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Much to state to get it wrong. (laughs) Yeah. But this is a fortunate position to be in. In life, it's always about learning Mm. and growing no matter what age. In this kind of, you know, world that I'm operating in with the backdrop of climate change and a market that is developing very, very quickly, you kind of feel like you're always running and you're having to make quick decisions. And there's a lot of second guessing, but sometimes you just got to grab the bull by the horns and go. And that's it, really. And you've got the tenacity for that, for sure. And all of the learning that you talk about, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned along the way, would you say? To listen. To listen. To listen. To listen. I don't think we do enough of it. We're very quick to speak our minds before listening to others. And I say that in just a sense that especially when you are leading the growth of a fast-paced organization, you do not want to forget the the great contribution that your teams can make and the people that work around you can make and but also to make sure that you're picking up you know all the things that are happening without just listening to self i mean there's 
so many different lessons in life, but I have had that one said a lot about the importance of listening that we underestimate that. But yeah, one of many. <laughs> and as you say, the deep listening, it's, it's a really difficult skill because so often we're thinking about what we need to say in response to what the person in front of us is saying. And we actually miss so much of the conversation and, and where the real nuts and bolts are. So I think that's, yeah, it's a good lesson. And thank you for sharing. And we're at the point in the podcast now where we play a little game and it's called the five second game rule. And you have five seconds to give me three answers to a question. Oh, wow. Are you ready? Let's see. (laughs) (laughs) So let's have a go. In the five second game rule, can you give me the three traits that you look for in other people? Well, definitely loyalty. That's number one trustworthy and definitely confidence confidence loyalty and trustworthy i think they're good traits and let's try another one so let's do in the five second game rule can you give me and i know you can your three favorite podcasts oh (laughs) three i can definitely tell you what my number one is that i listen to all the time go Um, for it the How to Fail with Elizabeth Day. And I think that if anybody is into the podcast scene, that is one you don't want to miss. The other ones are a little bit more boring because they're work-related. So that one's definitely from a personal desire to listen to. The others, definitely The Economist. I just use that as my kind of drip feed of the latest developments happening around the world. Because, you know, when you head down in the business as much as I am, hard to lift up and see what's happening other than things like the U.S. election, which you can't miss. <laughs> no, that was everywhere. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I, I don't think I actually have a third one, Angela. It's terrible. Like I'm, you know, can't really think off the top of my head any of ones that stand out. I mean, happy. Oh, what is the um, happy? Um, Fern Cotton's. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a great one. And this How to Fail one, I'm going to look it up because I haven't heard of this one. And I know you were speaking really highly of it at the beginning. So I'm going to have a a listen to that one. And I just feel like we've run out of time so quickly and it's just gone like that. And there's so many more things that I want to ask you, but I need to ask you the killer question. And I can't wait to hear what you're going to say. And the killer question is, What's the absolute secret to success? Oof. Listening to your inner voice. Oh, listening to the inner voice. Have you got a name for yours? Oh, I don't. (laughs) Creative, but I will say that that inner voice, which again, meditation can help you tap into, but it is the one that has been with me from as long as I can remember. And listening to that and taking time out to listen to that. In the early start of this year, the irony is, could I have ever imagined that we'd be going into a lockdown as soon as March? And in January, I had just come off of a really, really heavy year in 2019 and needed to take a break and found myself attracted to going to a seven-day silent retreat. Oh, lovely. And off I went to do this retreat for the first time and everybody was having quite a laugh to think that I could actually survive a seven day silence retreat and make it through seven days. <laughs> but the irony was, is that it was more difficult to come out of it than it was to go into it. And for anyone that is listening, that is considering doing one, I would highly, highly recommend it. Of course, hopefully silence has, has been one that we can be tapping into over the course of this last year. Or so you know, it's almost like I was getting prepped for something that was coming because literally within a month's period, everything shut down. And I didn't have any like, you know, dramatic response to it. It was sort of, okay, well, this is just the extension of of what I started and, and where I need to be right now in this time. And so in that kind of space, you know, you do get perspective and you can hear more about what's going on inside. And that voice has been 
the driver to, you know, just keep going, just keep going and you'll get there eventually. And you're talking about the inner wisdom as opposed to the inner critic. Mm. So really getting deep and understanding who you are on the inside. Because of course we have all of the answers, but the inner critic often stops us from hearing that inner wisdom. Yes. I mean, this definitely is aside from any of the sort of you're not good enough voice. This is one that is actually the behind your choices, you know. The cheerleader. It's the cheerleader. You know, driven by your instincts is connected to that voice, you know, and listen to it because as long as it's not being the critical voice, of course. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, two separate ones, aren't they? I mean, or of the fact that you've done a silent retreat, it's something that I was considering at the start of the year. I didn't see it through. I didn't even get there. The, you know, the thought of being silent for a week, I just think it's incredible the fact that you did it. And you're right that, you know, the silence that many of us have experienced through lockdown has given us a little bit more space. But whether we've connected to that inner wisdom or not, I'm not quite sure, you know, speaking to lots of people, but For you, that's the absolute secret for success. And it's something that perhaps we can all go away and think about and think about how we can get connected more with that inner wisdom and learn and grow from it. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom so honestly and openly. I wish we could have another half an hour to dig more deeply into everything that you've done. It's just had a wonderful life. Hi. It's been an absolute joy. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And, um, and for sharing with the listeners. Definitely. Thanks a lot. I do hope that you enjoyed listening to the Mindset Mentor Meets podcast. If you did, be sure to check out the show notes to access all of those important links. For more about me, visit my website at www angela-cox.co.uk now i'd really love it if you could subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode and do leave us a five-star review because it really helps us to get noticed bye for now i do hope that you'll tune in next week and take good care